series called The Unseen with our lead pastor, Matt Nelson. Welcome back, Pastor Jim, gangsta. Come on now. He's refreshed, ready to roll, you can tell. Good to see you. How we doing? Good? Get your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter six. Launched in a brand new series this morning. Anybody enjoy watching the Olympics? Yeah? I'm really sad they're over. I could watch the Olympics every day. Some of you, you watch some of these sports and that thought goes through your mind. You're like, I, I might be able to do that right there. Anybody have that idea? Anybody watch break dancing? Come on, anybody see that? You see the Australian female break dancer? My wife's thinking about going to 2028 after watching her. How about the guy from Turkey that was the shooting guy? Anybody see that guy? I'm not sure what he does for a living. I don't think we wanna know. Uh, but some of these, I love watching track and field. I could watch. And sometimes I'll be watching the table tennis and I'm like, man, my life could have gone a different path. I think I could be there with those guys. But no, I couldn't. Glad you're with us as we're launching into this brand new series called The Unseen. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna explore a lot of different topics from signs and wonders and miracles, our authority that we have in Christ, deliverance, prayer, weapons of warfare. Uh, we're gonna cover the series over August and September. There's a book out in the lobby uh, that you can purchase that goes really well with this series called Screw Tape Letters. Anybody read that one by C.S. Lewis? We reference it often around here because it's such a phenomenal book. A book where kind of two demons in, in training are are trying to take down this young man named the patient. And C.S. Lewis actually opens the entire book with this quote, and I wanna open us this morning with this. He says, there are two equal and opposite heirs into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Two ditches that you can fall into. One, to kind of disbelieve altogether. The other, to try to give too much time and attention. I think these are the two most common responses to spiritual warfare in the spiritual realm. Number one is this, this obsessive preoccupation with the spiritual, where everything is the devil, everything is demonic, everything is spiritual. Like, you, you gotta wait in, in traffic, because there's, there's a wreck in front of you, and you gotta wait for 11 minutes on the interstate, and you're like, this is the work of the enemy, right? <laughs> Anybody ever been there? I, I don't know if that is the work of the enemy. Like, you go to Trader Joe's after service today, and you're walking the aisles, and you finally get to the aisle. Have anybody have ever had their cookie butter? Come on now, yeah. it's so good. And they're out, and you're like, not today, Satan. <laughs> you know? Everybody, everything is spiritual. Everything is the work of the enemy in your life. How many know not everything is a spiritual attack? Right. You, you wouldn't believe how often I wanna say that to people, but I have to do it in a really nice way. I just wanna, you know, you're not, that's, it's not the enemy, it's your own spiritual immaturity. <laughs> you know? That wasn't the work of the enemy, that's because you're foolish and you made the wrong decision. Not everything is spiritual. Number two, we can fall into the other ditch, which is this complacent indifference. Many Christians live more like atheists or agnostic if I can't see it, if I can't prove it, then I can't believe it. And yet, sometimes we forget that we're walking and living this thing by, by faith, aren't we? I, I love, Cody is our creative director. He put together this awesome graphic for this series because he knows me well, and I didn't ask him to do this. I think it's beautiful. And the reason he did this is because he's heard me over the last 14, 15 years say this line a million times. If we could pull back the curtain on the physical and see the spiritual just for a brief second, how many know your life would never be the same? You would spend a whole lot less time worrying about what school your kid's about to go to and more time praying for them. Come on now. If we could just pull it back for a second and see, this is actually a 16th century Renaissance painting like the fallen of the rebel angels. If we could pull it back and see the reality, your prayer life would go to another level, I guarantee it. But we have to live this by faith. I think the average Christian actually approaches their life more like a vacation and less like a battle. Like we just, we just kinda like this laissez-faire, it doesn't matter, it's whatever, whatever goes, goes. And it was June uh, 6th, 1944, over 5,000 ships carrying over 160,000 allied soldiers stormed the beaches of Normandy to give a decisive blow to the Nazi party. We know this as D-Day. 
We know that as these men were getting out of those ships that day, that they were walking into just this battle zone where they did not have the upper hand. In fact, many of them were climbing over dead bodies just to get out of the ship, to get up on the shore. They, they knew that they were vulnerable. They knew they were going into this attack where the, the enemy absolutely wanted to destroy them and, and had the upper hand. And the image that I get in my head of many followers of Jesus is us getting out of the ships on the, on the shores of Normandy and we've got our beach bag. And we're like, man, did you bring the SPF 30 today? Or do you just have the 15? Like, I, just, I need a little bit more. And we're trying to find the place to put, put our, our, our chairs and our, you know, our umbrella and we're like got our inflatable pool toys and you wanna look at somebody and be like, you are in a battle with an enemy that wants to destroy you. Stop acting like it's a vacation. You have an enemy that wants to take you out Pastor Sam Storms in Oklahoma City, uh, pastor of Bridgeway Church, uh, recently retired, wrote some incredible things on spiritual warfare. I've learned a lot from him. He shared this uh, over the years, and so I want to give him uh, kind of props on this because I took a list of his and kind of adapted it, but a lot of it came from him. He talks about why Christians are tragically ignorant of and dangerously ill-prepared for spiritual warfare, and I just love how he worded that. And it starts with this. Number one is just an ignorance of the Bible. It's just an ignorance. It's just like we're not, we're not immersed in Scripture. We kind of allow Scripture to be kind of on the periphery of our life, which is what happens today in our political world where we just kind of use God to back up whatever else we believe, but we actually don't go to Scripture to see if God actually says it. And what happens in this context in the spiritual realm is, is look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Everywhere Paul turned, he was in constant battle with people, constant battle with circumstances, False teachers, Jewish leaders, pagans, Roman governments, disloyal followers. Everywhere Paul goes, there's struggle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, which I think is going to kind of be a guiding verse for this entire series. Look what Paul says to us. He says, for our struggle is not against, say it with me, not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. Has anybody ever stopped after reading that and you'd be like, I don't know, Paul. Do you know my boss, <laughs> right? Have you met my spouse? Don't look to your left or right right now, right? <laughs> I, I think they have a name. I'm pretty sure they're flesh and blood. Paul says it's actually not, it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And this is coming from the man who had all of these people coming at him all the time from every single direction. He says there's actually a reality behind the reality. Number two, why are we ill-prepared? Irrelevance of the Bible. Not only are we ignorant of it, but we just act like it doesn't matter. Like Satan is more like believing in Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is full of specific references to the reality of the spiritual world. Angels, demons, this heavenly divine council. There's 273 specific references to angels in the Bible. I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, we get all the, these angelic beings that show up time and time again. And yet in our worlds, we're just like, yeah, maybe, probably not. I don't know. Seems like more like science fiction than reality. Number three is this, this is kind of a weird one to say, but the victory over the cross, the victory of the cross. Sometimes the victory of Jesus over evil gets us to think that we can passively resist the enemy. Oh, Jesus has already done the work, so it doesn't matter. I'm gonna show up to the battle with my beach bag because the battle's already been won. The answer to that is yes and no. Has the battle been won? Yes. Does that mean that you can passively resist the enemy? No. In this world, until we get into the kingdom of come, to come, you will have to actively resist the power of the enemy at work in your life, even if you're a follower of Jesus. Even if the spirit of the living God lives inside of you, you can't just check out and be like, oh, I'm good, because the enemy wants to destroy you. Number four, why are we tragically ill-prepared? The fear of imbalance. I, I call this, this is the fear of getting weird. There's some of you that you're so fearful of things that you can't explain or understand that you don't, even, you don't even want to go there. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to do it. This is why people don't want to deal with the, the gifts of the Spirit or, or these different manifestations of the Spirit because if I can't understand it, then I don't want to experience it. But there's a lot of things that you can't understand, right? This doesn't mean that you have to get weird. This doesn't mean that next Sunday we're gonna have a bunch of snakes and we're gonna start handling them and talking about our authority, right? 
We're not gonna start waving flags in worship. Anybody ever go to a church where somebody's waving a banner or a flag in front of you? You know how hard it is to worship when somebody's doing this in front of you with a flag? I remember that as a kid. I'm like, oh, dear God, somebody, somebody do something about that. Has anybody ever tried to worship when there's a tambourine in the room? Anybody grow up to that church? Tambourines of the devil, I'm telling you. It's Satan's instrument. <laughs> My dad used to go find the tambourines and hide them because you got some lady that loves Jesus on the front row and she's off beat and the drummer's like, would you please stay on beat? You know, and it's just like, it's horrible. Getting weird. When we talk about these topics, you know what, it may open and introduce us to something that's beyond our comprehension and understanding. But that's okay because you and I aren't God, are we? It's okay for us not to know. Timothy Warner says this, he says, many Christians have become so accustomed to operating with no demonstration of spiritual power that they're bothered by any demonstration of it. I found that to be true. We get so accustomed to just to kind of going through the motions and living with no power, no manifestation, no spiritual word, just like anything like that, I don't know, mm, it just makes me uncomfortable. And there's this tension you and I have to wrestle and walk with because we're dealing with a topic here that's often unexplainable. We don't get all the details in scripture. If you remember several weeks ago, I was dealing with end times, uh, the second coming, the parousia. And how many know when you get with, with the second coming of Christ, people get weird because we don't get all the details. And people like all the details, and so when we don't get all the details from something, what do people wanna do? They wanna fill in the blank. So when I grew up in my background of being a Pentecostal charismatic, and when it came to spiritual warfare, you know what we did? We made stuff up. We made it up. We made it into an equation, a formula. Well, if you'll just do these four things, honey, then you'll be, you'll be set free and delivered. And I'm like, where are those four things anywhere in scripture? Guess what, they're not. They're just based off that person's experience. How many know your experience matters, but it's not what we base our theology off of, right? And so I had to wrestle through this. How do, we, how do we hold these things in tension where we don't just default to some superstitious nonsense or someone's personal experience, but we also understand there's things that we can't explain that we don't know. We've gotta root ourselves in the biblical story and hold certain things loosely. Number five, the last one is this, why are we tragically ill-prepared is the insulated lifestyles that many of us leave and our Western worldview. We live in a reality where most of the people around us don't believe in the spiritual realm. We don't see it operate, and so we think because we're not experiencing it that it doesn't happen and nobody else has experienced, experienced it. Well, let me just tell you, you need to get out of your little bubble because manifestations in the spiritual realm and the demonic are happening everywhere all the time. And if you're not aware with it, it's probably because you live a little bit insulated and maybe you're middle-class American Bible belt bubble. Come on. Here I find this fascinating, not all of you are gonna find this fascinating, but if not, just tune me out for the next two minutes and then pick back up with me. Dr. Carl Payne wrote a book on spiritual warfare about 10 years ago. I find this fascinating. He says, the more sophisticated or educated or knowledgeable a person or a society assumes itself, the more subtle and crafty the enemy becomes. You go into underdeveloped countries and you see far more demonic manifestations. That has been my personal experience. Why? Because they believe in the spiritual realm. It's as real as their hand in front of their face. So why don't you and I get to see all these manifestations? Why don't we always see the demonic activity at work? Here's what he says. He says, the reason we often don't see overt demonic manifestations like someone's eyes roll in the back of their head or foam at the mouth is because any sort of supernatural occurrence would at the very least get you to believe in the supernatural. See, I thought I was gonna be the only one thinking this is fascinating. A smarter, more subtle strategy of Satan is to move stealthily behind the scenes, distorting truth, bringing divisions, selling lies, making churchgoers church shoppers, turning kingdom people into political people, keeping the church in a state of apathy. I may get this tattooed on my back. I love it that much. <laughs> How I many know sometimes if God showed up or even a demonic influence showed up and did some kind of manifestation in front of you, you know what you would do? You would go to your prayer closet and the enemy doesn't want that. So he just puts you in a state of apathy. Oh, it's not real. It doesn't exist. There's no spiritual warfare. Don't peek behind the curtain and look. Just continue to go on with your life like nothing's happening. Drift in a state of apathy. Become political more than kingdom minded. And the enemy is like, why would I want to change that? 
2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of what? As an angel of, as an angel of light. You've heard me say over the years, if, if only he showed up with a pitchfork and a red suit, we'd be much more prepared. But he doesn't. Our enemy will transform himself into whatever form is best suited to deceive you and destroy you. You have an enemy who's a strategist, a schemer, a tactician, and guess what? The enemy plays the long game. Willing to play the long game. You struggle with bitterness and cynicism. Hopefully you're self-aware enough to know uh, your weaknesses. And if not, man, I, I hope that you find that out soon. You struggle with bitterness. You have a tendency to lead towards cynicism and faith in the church. And so what happens? All of a sudden, every time you pull up a social media feed, all it is is about a a so-called follower of Jesus doing something in the name of Jesus that looks nothing like Jesus. And then you pull up your social media feed, and it's another pastor who's fallen and had a moral failure. And you're like, man, this is everybody, isn't it? Or you look at this and that and it just feeds. How many know the enemy knows exactly what your weakness is and will feed you what he wants to feed you? And now you're thinking to yourself, this is what evangelical Christianity has turned into. It's a bunch of fake people. No, it's not. That's a small minority of people. And the enemy wants to deceive you thinking that it's everybody. God is always gonna reserve a remnant of people who are holy and kingdom-minded and raising up the standard of truth. It's not everybody. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. He will take on the form of what you're most susceptible. Oh, you're struggling with belief and your your understanding of God, and so all of a sudden you pick up on this professor and philosopher who's got these ideas, and it it seems to be good, and it's influential, and it's more based in this kind of deistic understanding of God like a watchmaker who sets the watch and kind of lays it on on the counter and, and God's just uninvolved because if God was truly involved in the world, how would all of these things play out? The enemy plays to your susceptibilities. You're struggling emotionally connecting with your spouse. This is how the enemy works. You didn't go out to destroy your life. But there's this emotional disconnection, and emotional disconnection and lack of friendship will lead to spiritual disconnection and usually physical and sexual disconnection. And so all of a sudden, you find yourself leaning towards somebody who is not your spouse because they kind of give you that emotional connection that you long for. And you didn't mean to destroy everything around you, but you opened up your life to someone emotionally who was not your spouse. How many of the, the enemy masquerades as an angel of light? It seems subtle. It doesn't seem like that big a deal. Satan will tailor his tactics towards you in a strategic way to your area of insecurity, to your place of vulnerability, to the opening in your armor. We'll pick up on the armor of God next week. To your place of vulnerability. Let's, let's, a few things that are gonna guide our discussion over the next few weeks. I am really, this message today is one long introduction. Uh, I don't always say this, but every week of this series I think builds on the last one, and so I know not everybody comes to church every week. This is a great series to keep up with online if you have to miss one, because it really is so much information that I've kinda gotta unpack it week by week. Guiding principles for this. There is a kingdom of God and there is a kingdom of Satan, and the two are in conflict. The two are in conflict. But let me ask this question. How did we get to this place in the story? This is gonna be a little bit deeper than we would normally go on a Sunday morning, but I think it's really, really important, so hang with me. This would be a great uh, City University class to dig into at a deeper level. God, the Trinity, are preexistent and all-powerful from the beginning, and they create out of who they are and what they desire. So think about this. We, it's a mystery, the Trinity, how God can be three persons, separate, yet one. Nobody created the Trinity. They are uncreated. They are preexistent from the very beginning. You go back all the way to the beginning, everything that was, it was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uncreated from the beginning, and they begin to create out of who they are. Well, who are they? A perfect fellowship and communion of love. Why does God, in the Trinitarian form, create? Because God loves. God could have just not created, but love leads us 
towards others, right? It leads us towards fellowship. It leads us towards communion. And God begins to create, and he, pl- he creates this place in this world. And Eden becomes the place, the Garden of Eden becomes the place where God dwells, where God fellowships, where he communes. Now, this next part is the part nobody talks about. Let's get weird. God creates an unseen world with spiritual beings. Well, pastor, when does God do this? I have no idea. Job 38, Psalm 82, all throughout scripture are these allusions to a spiritual world that's just as real as our physical world. This is divine counsels, angels, archangels, sons of God. These are, uh, we see seraphim and different uh, kind of spiritual beings all throughout the Old Testament. This is God's unseen family that he creates, a host of non-human beings whose domain is the unseen world. Why does God create them? They are designed to carry out God's will in the spiritual realm. They act as God's representative to do God's work throughout the world. We see that time and time again. Almost every reference to angelic beings is is, they're carrying out the will of God. We hear of divine counsels and a heavenly counsel. Even the book of Job, which Job is a weird book, but it kind of pulls back and you, you see this picture of the divine counsel of heavenly beings who are in conversation with each other. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 describe an angel, part of this unseen created world called the morning star, son of dawn, who rebels against God. We know this fallen angel as Lucifer. He thinks that equality with God and pride elevates him to a place that he thinks he can be God and he falls from this place of being God's agent to now being God's enemy. So God creates an unseen world with spiritual beings. God also creates a physical world with human beings. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. You and I are God's created representatives put on this earth to carry out his will and to bring his kingdom. So God has created an unseen world, a spiritual realm, to carry out his will. He creates a physical world. He creates you and I to be image bearers to bring his kingdom to reality wherever we go. In Genesis chapter three, Lucifer, this fallen angel, shows up in the form of a serpent. Now, I don't know if this messes you up, and I don't have time to really go here, um, but some people get kind of tripped up on this kind of stuff, on the imagery that the Bible portrays, and, and thinking of themselves, well, uh, is the serpent, or does, is the devil or the enemy Satan in Genesis 3, is he an actual snake? Uh, could he be? Sure. Is that what Genesis is trying to write, the writer of Genesis is trying to tell us? No. That word in the Hebrew is more of like crafty, subtle. The Genesis writer is telling us that the enemy comes into the Garden of Eden subtly, stealthily, with an idea to deceive. How many of the original sin of Lucifer is thinking with equality with God can be be attained? It's that I know more than God knows, and how many knows that's the same thing he deceives Eve with? And the sin of Adam and Eve destroys the fellowship God created in Eden, fellowship that he wanted with the spiritual realm that he created, and fellowship with the, the physical humanity that he created. How many know God did not have to create any of us? Why did God create us? Because of love. God gave us free will, freedom. How many know that love demands free will? If you and I don't get to choose, it's not love. Free will and love invites risk. God knew the risks of creation. He knew that creating somebody uh, in his image to have fellowship with him was a risk because we could choose him and we could choose life without him. There are spiritual and heavenly realities just as real as the physical and earthly realities you see. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. You're like, didn't we just read this? Yep, we did. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The word that Paul actually uses here for struggle, we find nowhere else in the New Testament. It's this connotation of wrestling, like first century, like Greco-Roman wrestling, where it's hand-to-hand combat, like you are engaged in a struggle with another person. 
and Paul saying this Christian life is a struggle of cosmic proportions where we are wrestling against the gods of this world and the spiritual forces of evil. And we could try to break down what all of these are, rulers and authorities, powers of this dark world, evil forces in the heavenly realms, but what is Paul saying? He's grouping them all together and saying there is a spiritual reality behind the physical reality. Ephesians 1, verse 19, if we go earlier in the book of Ephesians, Paul says this, that power is the same as the mighty strength God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Why is this relevant to our conversation? Because Paul is going back and he's alluding to what Christ has done through the cross. Through the cross, God has now taken the person of Jesus and elevated him far above every ruler, every authority, every power of evil in this world. You have authority. In a couple weeks, we're gonna talk about how you and I walk in our authority as followers of Jesus because I think there's a lot of followers of Jesus and Christians walking around who don't know who they are and don't know their authority. We're almost acting like we're power, powerless and just whatever happens, happens. And, and God's setting the record straight. He says the work of Jesus, the work of the cross has defeated every dark power in this world. It's disarmed the work of the enemy. What's our goal over the next few weeks? This is our goal. As followers of Jesus, we must be committed to rediscovering a biblical imagination for the spiritual world, spiritual world, our authority in Christ, and the weapons of warfare God has given us to overcome the powers of the enemy. Like, Pastor, what's a, what's a biblical imagination? Imagination is not a word that I'm using as make-believe. A biblical imagination is a way that you see the world. How do you see the world? Do you see the world as God sees the world and as the world that's described to us in the text, in the biblical text, or do you see the world as the world around us sees the world? Can, can we rediscover a biblical imagination for how God sees the world and the reality of the spiritual realm that's behind everything that we see and know? We must recover a biblical perspective of the unseen world. See, there's the effects of, of secularism and mod modernity on, on our current world. Secularism in the world that we currently live in says the world is a closed system of cause and effect. I, I, if I can't explain it, if it's not rational, then it's not real. Secularism leaves no room for the miraculous. Now, I, I can't believe what can't be explained by science or what's not real. Secularism says the world is only governed by rational control, and we're gonna get into this in two weeks. I'm gonna specifically be talking about signs and wonders how we see the miracles of God, why we often don't see the miracles of God, how we have to confront the ideas that we live in today of secularism and rational thought. Look what Luke Timothy Johnson says in his book called Miracles. He says, imagining the world that scripture imagines, you, you, you will recall, means focusing less on the world that created the Bible and more on the world that the Bible creates. This is what developing a biblical imagination means. It, it means that you can look at all of the data and the science and the reason, and it can lead you to this place where you're like, man, it, it just seems unlikely based on rational thought. And yet God has created us, he's created this world around us, and he says there's a reality behind the reality. And you and I have to rediscover what it means to live in this biblical world where we allow scripture to, to shape our thinking, our worldview, our reality, where we live things by faith and not just by reason or science or data, where we, we don't have to sacrifice our intellect. It doesn't discount the need for science or medicine or psychologist or therapist or education. It just admits there is a spiritual reality that exists just as much as the physical reality. It's not getting rid of the things of the world or rational thought. It's just understanding the way that God created the world to operate. How many know you and I need the power of God active in our life? We need the supernatural. We need the miraculous. We need to walk in the authority in Christ over the powers of darkness 
that exist more than ever before. It's living your life and walking every day in just this reality that the powers of darkness and evil all around us are looking for a place, dominion, looking for a foothold, looking for a place to establish themselves. We, as followers of Jesus, are walking around bringing the kingdom of God and pushing back the darkness in all of these places. That's our role. How many know you can't push the darkness back if you don't believe in the reality of light and darkness, of good and evil, of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan? That at times, beyond our understanding and belief, there are spiritual realities that exist that, w- that we only break through in prayer. In prayer. Like you and I have to have a prayer life. You have to have it. If you don't have an active prayer life, you are missing out on the greatest weapon the enemy or or God has given you to defeat the enemy. Like you have that at your disposal. Over the next several weeks, we're going to dive deeper and deeper into these teachings of our weapons, what God has given us, our authority deliverance, things like that. Sometimes you need to be delivered and set free. Sometimes there are things that are attached to your life and your soul from your past or something that happened or genealogy or family dynamics and you're like, Pastor, I don't know about that. Let me, trust me. (laughs) Trust me. And you need to be set free from those things. Some of you are bound by a stronghold. You're like, what is that? What is strong? A stronghold is the enemy has you so wrapped up in a lie or untruth, or addiction in your life, you feel powerless. That's why you have the church and the body of Christ to come alongside you, to pray over you, to lay hands on you, and believe that something in the spiritual realm is releasing that. That is as real a reality as the hand in front of our face. Our next midweek, September 5th, we're gonna take some time during that midweek. First Thursday of every month, we stop and have time of worship and prayer, but this coming midweek, we're gonna stop and we're gonna be praying specifically for miracles. If you need healing in your body, you need deliverance, you need a touch from God. Something you see over and over again in the church, throughout scripture, gathered together, believing Uh, in faith, praying for each other, and laying on hands. There's something as God uses authority throughout scripture, and even biblical authority, and and pastoral church authority to lay hands on people, the elders, the pastors of the church, to believe and to pray, and we're gonna do that. We don't control outcomes. We're just obedient, right? We position ourselves to do what God wants to do. In September, we're gonna go into a month of prayer. We have a month of prayer during Lent every year where we pray and fast. We're gonna be opening up our prayer room, which is right around the corner. It's being worked on. In a couple weeks, you'll be able to walk through it and kind of do an open house and check it out. Once our prayer room opens in September, uh, all throughout the week, you'll be able to schedule that room uh, for an hour on your own to go in. Why? Because we believe prayer that changes things. I believe it changes things. Like my vision for for this city has always been city transformation to see the darkness pushed back. Do you know this area that God has placed us in right here behind, which is full of of poverty? I I believe that 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 area of our city is gonna be transformed by the gospel. Anybody believe that? You know where it starts? Prayer. I I believe as we gather together in prayer, even as we open up this prayer room, what happens in in the heavenly realms and the spiritual realm is the darkness begins to be pushed back. You are literally taking ground. And before you can take ground in the physical, I believe you have to take ground in the spiritual. Not just in our city, in our community. I believe this applies to your life. I believe it applies to your kids and your grandkids, your future. God, increase my faith for the supernatural, for the things that I see and the things that I don't see. I want you to stand your feet with me this morning. I wanna lean into two questions as we wrap up our time. The first one is this, will we have ears to hear and eyes to see what God is doing all around us in both the physical and the spiritual realms? 
You can have eyes that are not seeing and ears that are not hearing. Jesus tells us that. In fact, a lot of the people that walked around with Jesus saw but didn't see. They heard but didn't hear. Well, you and I have eyes to see and ears to hear. Because once you walk out these doors and you go into this world, the reality of the spiritual realm is not real to them, to the world. They live by a different worldview. Will you and I have eyes to see, ears to hear what God is doing? That right now there is a cosmic battle and struggle for your life, for your faith, for your healing, for your freedom, for your family. I pray that we do have eyes to see, ears to hear. Second question is this, will the church be a place shaped by a secular culture that rejects the mysterious or the miraculous or will we embody a community drenched with the possibilities of the supernatural? Will you and I have the faith to pray the prayer of healing? I get it, sometimes it's hard to do. I'm no different than you. There are times where people are like, man, pastor, would you pray for me for healing? And there's sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I have faith today to pray for that. Will we still believe that God wants to do the supernatural? Would, do we believe that God wants to intervene into our ordinary everyday and do things that are beyond our understanding? Will we live as an alternate community in this world that believes that God can do all things and wants to intervene? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that as we lean into this over the next several weeks that you would reshape our hearts, our imaginations, increase our faith to believe, to have faith in the things that we cannot see, to be okay with things that are unknown. God, we wanna see you move. We wanna see you move in power and might. God, we wanna see signs and wonders. We wanna see the miraculous Father. We wanna engage in spiritual warfare as, as, as people who have victory through the cross. Father, shape our imagination. Give us a biblical worldview, Father. Give us a faith to believe in all things. God, where we've doubted, where there's been confusion, Father, I just pray, Father, that you would give us fresh faith to believe. God, right now, we pray against every strategy and work of the enemy in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our futures. God, right now, we pray that we are aware of the strategies and the tactics of the enemy. We understand that the enemy comes as an angel of light. God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, Father, how the enemy is at work around us. God, I pray even as we walk and live out our days, as we go from this place today, as we, as we go to work and to school and different things tomorrow, God, give us eyes to see what you're doing, where you're at work, God, that we would walk in our authority that you've given us through the work of the cross. Thank you for that, Father. Holy Spirit, would you do a deep, deep work in us? If you would, just prepare yourself as we're going to come to the table this morning.